On the east side of Lake Washington, we, we actually have a pretty good idea of how the project will, will look when it's all done. The, the legislature helped us this past session uh, by establishing the six-lane alternative as the one we should advance. So across the middle of the lake here, we would have uh, three lanes in each direction, two for general purpose traffic, one HOV, and uh, a bike pedestrian path. So to the governor's office in December, a finance plan for the project, which is uh, we always have to look at two features here because we have the Arctic vote coming up in November. So we're, we're going to actually prepare uh, multiple scenarios of, of, over the upcoming months, and depending on the outcome of the November election, we'll submit to the governor's office and then subsequently uh, to the legislature how this project could be financed. There's going to be a high-capacity transit study going on uh, while the, the mediator is doing their work, and there will be a help. Engineers, the bridge engineers, some of our environmental staff, <clears throat> and the bridge maintenance crews to hear about our program and to think and to see the vulnerabilities firsthand. <clears throat> Throughout the tour, you're also going to hear about the improvements that we would have in the corridor. We're on top of the corridor. Stormwater treatment is something that we're in, looking forward to adding to our corridor. Right now, the water is not. so much work done out here on a single weekend closure, it would take us probably two months of nightly closures. Again, I would like to caution everybody to watch for moving equipment and watch for open hatches. out here when there's no vessel passing through will take about 17 minutes. Every, everything is timed from, from the moment the flashing ambers start until the signals go yellow and then they go red and the gates come down. We do the oncoming gates first and then the offgoing gates. this barrier are something that we can only service when there's no traffic out here. We do come out once a month, the second Thursday of every month, and we do a series of maintenance openings. And that gives us an opportunity to at least lube some things and change some lights and exercise the equipment. But for the most part, uh, these summer closures, this is when we get the full service. thing that'll happen, the control system out here runs off of what we call a PLC. It's a programmable logic controller. And it is set up so that you can't do anything out of sequence. The computer will not let you raise the deck until it's satisfied that this barrier is open. It won't let you open the barrier until it is satisfied that the gates are down. 
everything goes smooth when the computers are working. When the computers go offline, and it happens, we also have full manual capability out here. Most of the equipment out here has, all of it has double redundancy. So,
Two other mixes. One is a uh, fiber, has fiber in it. Another one has chrome rubber in it. And what we're going to do is put those three down, those sections down, in a long enough length, 2,600 feet, so that we can take noise readings over the next five years and compare the standard mix versus the fiber mix versus the rubber mix. We need about five years to be able to tell longevity. You know, is it going to wear out? Are the studs on the tires going to affect it at all? Is it going to stay down for five years? or does it make any difference at all, or does it make a huge amount of difference. And there'll be an engineering study versus uh, people's opinions, so we'll be able to have actual numbers. This is the second of three locations. The first location was South on I-5 in Linwood. That's already been down. We paid, put the pay down uh, last year. This is the one this year, and then next year we'll put some down on four or five, I think is the schedule. Now, why was this section chosen? I don't know exactly why this was chosen over. Yeah, you can have that, okay. Yeah. Well, what's Mia gonna? Yeah, Mia Waters. We've got a, we've got our noise and air expert, Mia Waters, and she is. She'll be able to tell you more of the details. Yeah. So, um, why did this come about? Why did the uh, 
uh, less noisy asphalt uh, piqued the interest of Washington State Department of Transportation? Why are we trying it out? Where did all that come from? To the best of your knowledge, since me is not here. Yeah. Well, as we build roads, people get built and live closer near highways, state highways, and we widen state highways. So it's always an issue, as well as construction and, and air and costs and everything. It's just one of those issues that have to be dealt with. And then we have various methods of dealing with noise. One of the noise walls. And this is just another method that we're testing to see if this will be more viable or, or just as valuable or better than noise walls. Um, and so we test how much, if we can get a pavement mix that we can put down, that'll reduce the decibel level, a measured decibel level of vehicles when they drive on it. So that's why it's called quieter pavement, because quieter is meant to be quieter than what it is now. If it's quiet pavement, you can't really have quiet pavement because that means nobody's driving on it. So there is no such thing as quiet pavement. Right? It's a hovercraft, I think, it's a quiet pavement. So the reason we've done it is other states have, have been doing this, one other, uh, and they, I think it's maybe Arizona or some other states, but Mia can tell you about those. And so the uh, legislators and the, the public have asked us to do experimental locations for this. All right, so now as the um, construction guru out here, what is interesting about this part of the project for you? The weather, it's nice to have had no rain right now because as you can see we're doing it concurrent with the bridge closure and they do that at this time every year and they have to close the bridge and do maintenance so we decided to latch onto that and take advantage of this time. And so the weather cooperated and so we were able to put this down without really impacting the, tra the traveling public any worse than normal or than we would for the maintenance project. What's uh, interesting about this is it's only three eighths of an inch thick. This asphalt is only three eighths of an inch thick. Normally, we put down asphalt about two inches thick. So this is really thin, and it's, it goes very quick, very fast. We'll be able to get it all down in the weekend, hopefully. Um, so it's just a, essentially a standard paving project with a different type of mix. And as you can see in the sample we've given you, there really is no. You really can't tell. There's no secret to the to the mix. There's no. It doesn't look any different than standard than what we got here, which drive on now. Now, something uh, was mentioned earlier about the stickiness of this out asphalt and how paving it is a little bit different than uh, paving your regular old loud asphalt. What can you tell me about that? Well, it's a different type of mix, and so you have different types of oil, different types of rock, and then the two different mixes, one has fiber added, one has crumb rubber. And so they all react a little differently, respond a little bit differently to weather and being placed. So. But once it gets to cool off, where it's to, uh, to the right temperature, it's just it looks going to react just like the regular asphalt that we're driving on. So people aren't going to be able to notice the difference between regular asphalt and this for a while. They might notice it's quieter. They might, but we're not going to go with opinions. We want to go with actual readings over a five-year period so we can use facts rather than opinions. Now I'm seeing a lot of white foam coming out of the back of these. Um pavers here. I was told that's detergent. Is that because of the stickiness or do you know anything about that? Yeah, the top oil used on this and the crumb rubber, for example, can, can once it's melted, it can stick to the rollers on the, on the roller machines. And so they use just a little bit of soap. They found soap works really well to keep it from sticking because you want to roll the asphalt, but you don't want it to roll it up carpet, you want to roll it up like carpet, you just want it to stay down. So they're using a little bit of soap. So we had to do some special environmental features to make sure that the soap wasn't an issue. Okay. So do we want to show these? Do you these? want to talk about the stuff you put in to make it quieter? They can see it in You'll your see, hands? You can, you can see this down when you talk to Mia too, but this stuff right here. Nice and high. This stuff right there. This is what's called the crumb rubber that's being added. Actually, this do you want to hold it like kind of close to your face, sort of? That's this is the crumb rubber that they're going to add to the asphalt mix. That's what we call the rubber pavement. This is a sample that's being added to the fiber, the fiber asphalt. So these are the two asphalt, the fiber asphalts we're putting down, and then in the middle of them, in a section, we're putting down regular asphalt. All the stuff that we drive on. How much quieter is it? That's you can ask Mia. She's got some readings from. She might have some readings from last year from Linwood. Because they've had some down for a while. She might have readings for you. It's more expensive. It is. It's 
definitely not quieter on the on the on the pocketbook. But we apply less. It's three eighths of an inch thick, but it's quite a bit more expensive, and we don't know if that's because it's always going to be that more more expensive, or because it's a new thing, or what. So that's part of the process to decide um, if it's is it really quieter, and if it's that much quieter, how much more it costs. So you're kind of an experiment. It's a very experimental stage. That's why it's five years long. We do it three locations in the on the, the uh, uh, west side here of the mountains. So we'll be able to test, test for longevity, uh, studded tires, weather, placement, and get some actual facts out of it. I think I'm good unless you want some more stuff. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, plenty. What are you doing here? Uh, repairing a crack uh, by the storm. This happened in the, the last windstorm? Uh, December. Okay. It hit the wall and, and fractured, put a good fracture in, in the barrier. Um, so this is a, one of the repairs of the storm damage. They're, they jackhammered out all the, the broken concrete and have formed it and poured it. This is just another illustration, is it, of just how old this fridge is? Or is that just like, or why we need a new design? Or um, the, the bridge, this design on the bridge does uh, lend itself to having this type of damage. The new bridge will be raised up, won't have this, this type of wall. and. Um, Debris from the from the lake will be able just to go right over the pontoons. You know what's interesting is that with all this high tech stuff, we're looking at elevated barges and all this stuff, and we're just repairing a wall. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of low tech stuff going on here too. Oh yeah, but it, it's all meaningful work that really does need to, to get done. And this is a safety issue because uh, this this wall not only um, you know it protects the drivers from going through and, and out into the lake. Big. It's a huge, huge. What are we difference. finding so far? Well, uh, so far that you've been out here. Well, it's early in the inspection, so um, right now we're just getting started. Uh, uh, the inspectors are, have just started to look, and right now we're just making all our repairs. We're right on schedule with those those repairs, and and the inspectors are, are um, still looking. And uh, how much longer do you think this bridge is going to last? Can't make that prediction. No. <laughs> Tell me about the span and how you said. I think. No, I think it was Archie said, never mind. So, <laughs> about how we like it, but we want to get rid of it. Oh, yeah, you know, you, you love to hate it. Um, you know, it's a it's a fun place to work. It, it gives our guys uh, um, a lot of work. It, they, they love doing uh, the mechanical, electrical work. Um, and, and I think they've done a good job holding it together. Great. Could you say your name and spell it? Rick Rada, R-O-D-D-A. And title? Assistant Superintendent, Bridge Maintenance. Rick, uh, how old is this bridge? This is what? Uh, 40 years old. So if this bridge could talk, it would uh, have some stories to tell. What, what, would, uh, what would this bridge have to talk about? Oh, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think it would, uh, you know, talk about some of the big, the high winds and, uh, um, I don't know. I mean, it, is it, it used to rock and roll. Is it a tired know? bridge? I think it is. I, I think it's tired. Uh, I, uh, I think the engineers have done a lot to, to try to hold it together um, with their um, you know, updates and modernizing it, but 
the, the structure itself is old, and um, you can only do so much with that. But you keep on plugging. We do, and we love it. continue to wear away these, these gears would be gone if we didn't replace it so you start to have a lot of slop um, and eventually they won't even turn there, there won't be enough face um, on, on each of these teeth uh, to, to grab the rest of the, the gearbox to make it turn to open the drop. And, and where did you get that and how long had it been there? How long did that last? Uh, this was found during one of their regular inspections that's what the engineers do they they, they pull these out they, they look at uh, different portions of the gearboxes, of all aspects of the machinery. And they found this a while back in one of them and was programmed to have these, these gearboxes pulled out this summer and sent out for repair and refurbishment. And how much do those cost and how important are they, how I, vital? You know, I don't know what the cost is, but they're extremely important to the operation of the draw spin. Can you hold it up and show it to us? Sure. Point out where they're worn. Sure. The teeth are worn all through here on this end. This is the stuff you're looking for. Yes, this is some of the stuff we're looking for. All right, you guys want to get in a pontoon? Waters and your title? I'm the Air Quality Acoustics and Energy Programs Manager. I'm hoping I do noise. Okay. <laughs> I'm hoping that you can give me an analogy of what it means. Like I'm like, what's quieter pavement mean? What do you mean noise reduction? Can you give me an analogy that would bring it home for me and our viewers on what that means in a nutshell? Quieter pavement is a way of improving the noise environment um, and basically. 70 to 90 percent of the noise from the, from the traffic at high speed comes from a tire on the road. And so what we're trying to do is create a smoother surface with air pockets that will absorb the noise energy instead of sending it out into the atmosphere. And how does this help the people uh, around here? I mean, so I'm assuming this is going to be for your neighbors. <laughs> yes, indeed. For all of our neighbors in Puget Sound, this is meant to uh, help them it be more uh, have a more soothing experience as well because there are two things about noise that we pay attention to the first is the total noise energy the decibels that you hear the second is the frequency of noise so if you have a high frequency like a mosquito that can be very annoying to the ear but if you lower those frequencies reduce them more to the bass tones then it's more soothing for folks. And so the quieter pavement, as it absorbs those high frequency in the wine, has a more soothing experience while both driving on the road and also for the people who live near that road. It's a five, at least a five year study. What do you, uh, we've already seen it on some portions on I-5 from what I understand. What are we seeing so far? So far, when we first put it down, when it's brand new, it can get five to six decibels of reduction comparing the dense graded, our standard asphalt, 
to the open graded asphalt with the air pockets in it. However, our big challenge is how long will those benefits last? And the experience that we've had in Linwood is that those benefits start to degrade fairly quickly. And so we have seen a drop off and now the difference between our standard pavement and our test quieter pavements is one to two decibels. We're trying to see over a five, possibly 10 year period if those noise levels will change and go down again or if they'll stay and keep going up. And again, what is the, the point of this? Why, why do we want to do this? And how expensive is it? We want to do this because noise walls, even though they work very well for where we put them, doesn't work for everyone everywhere. And so we want to expand our repertoire, find out places where we can improve our overall noise environment in many places where noise walls don't work. And so can we help improve our overall neighborhoods even if we can't build noise walls everywhere? And is this a lot more expensive? Is it a lot more involved? Or is it kind of the same? Well, for expense, it's a question of the long term because the material that we're putting down the test, at least for now, is about twice as expensive per ton of asphalt. However, you're only putting down half as much. So if you're putting down uh, half an inch of the quieter pavement, but a full inch of the standard pavement, it kind of levels out in some ways. However, the big question is the longevity because standard dense graded asphalt will last about 16 years. The quieter pavements, at least in Arizona, they're finding will last eight to 10 years, and that may be about half the lifespan. So we need to look at it to see how durable it really is. Let's talk about the car a little bit. Oh, oh yeah. Sure. What's a car? Do you want to go over here? Because I can kind of point down to the different parts of it. Yeah. Ooh, can I put this mic on your picture? Yeah. Thank you. Is that your mic? Sure. No, this is his mic. Okay, put it on this side. Mm -hmm. I have lots of pockets, too. You may want to get two different shots here because we have a microphone inside the car uh -huh. and we also have the ones down by the wheel. Now, how does it work? With this, the quieter pavement mobile or test mobile, we have two different ways of measuring noise. The first is inside the car, right at where a passenger's head would be, in which we're trying to find out what a person driving in a car would experience going over the roadway. So how does the noise for the driver going over our dense graded asphalt versus our quieter pavement test really work? The second test, starts with a computer inside in which we have microphone cables running down and we've got two microphones in these little black pods one on the leading edge of the tire in the front or excuse me two on the leading edge of the tire and two on the trailing edge of the tire and the reason for this is that we're trying to capture the noise that comes from the entire wheel going round. There are three ways that that happens. The tread block, when it hits the pavement, will uh, make a, a sound. As it travels over the pavement, kind of slips, it'll make another sound. As it snaps off of the roadway, it'll make a third sound. And that comprises the whole uh, noise environment. And so this is meant to capture just the noise that's coming off of the roadway so that we can separate it from the jackhammers and the airplanes and the engine noise and other things going on around us so we get a very pure noise measurement. So how often will you come out for our this? We will be out with this vehicle every month to take a measurement because we want to see how the noise environment is working with this pavement over time given that we have studded tires we want to look at the wear of that and also we want to find out how the winter differs from the summer because the temperature on the roadway will play a role the humidity in the air uh, and so we want to see how all of those factors in addition to the actual wear on the roadway with the studs and the heavy traffic changes um, the noise coming off
All right. What's your name? Nia Waters. Okay, and what's your title? I'm the Air Quality, Acoustics, and Energy Programs Manager for Washington State DOT. I'm the noise person. Thanks. Which one is going on? Really? That's pretty scary. It's scary stuff. Then lose yourself. Keep your speech to a minimum. The representative of Madison Park Community Council disappearing into this hole in the ground while meanwhile the people over there are having their picnic. <laughs> it's quite bizarre. Really. <laughs>
Your ambient temperature from now until about September will run about 100, 115 degrees at least. Um, for you guys, all the doors are open, but the doors are typically closed, so we'll have rain on the ceiling. Um, and so we'll get that uh, through about the end of September. You have one question? Yeah. 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 High, high moisture. Lots of moisture in here. So this is an anchor cable, right? This is an anchor cable. Uh, my hand is on the actual anchor block itself. Uh, this is what holds the bridge in place. There's a twin to this just on the other side of the wall. There's a north and south cable. These ones run about 500 feet. They're running at 65 tons of pressure on them right now. On the north side and one on the south side, there's approximately 58 cables. This is the west lower deck and this is similar to what the new bridge would look like with a raised um, deck so as we get further down it it, it, it really does simulate it uh, the pontoons will be similar to this uh, large waves will be able to come over without a barrier and can go right across the the pontoon and the roadway will be higher up and won't be affected by waves wind action and, and that sort of thing um, without a draw span, the, the bridge will be able to handle uh, 90 some mile an hour winds. Um, so our regular storms of probably 40 miles an hour um, shouldn't affect this bridge hardly at all. The, the, new, the new bridge. On, on this bridge, I mean, it, it's an old, older structure. And if you see, see the light concrete there, that's where there used to be a concrete barrier along here. You can see up how high it was. The water used to come over here and flood and would actually be like a swimming pool in here. Um, so there were, the first time when, it, when this started, they, they cut sections out to let, so the water would drain off. But when they went to put the post-tensioning on the bridge, 
The, the bridge is already, so let me go back, the bridge is already about seven inches lower in the water today than when it was built. So whenever they do or upgrade on this structure, they have to take the same amount of weight off. They can't put any more weight on it. So they look, every time they want to do something, they have to figure out how to remove stuff, remove weight. So cutting all the concrete barrier off around and putting up cable barrier was one of their options and one of the ways they, they removed weight from the deck. So it's seven inches lower because you've added weight. Correct. It's not because of the we, we have overlay. We have, uh, you know, the, the deck's been overlaid, um, all the post tensioning. Um, there's a number of things. All these hatches are different. We've added uh, pumping ports. All these pipes that come out, they're all pumping ports that go down to uh, the different uh, cells. So if we were to have a catastrophic failure, a hole where the bridge was to take on water, we have pumps that we come up. We we have a we know what cell it's uh, we're taking on water. We can just plug right into them, and and start pumping out. So all these things that had added weight to the bridge um, keeps getting it lower in the water. So uh, they have to remove weight. These, these hatches are much heavier than the original. The original hatches leaked. So. Um, they, they weren't worth trying to refurbish, so these are a much more secure, uh, watertight hatch. Yes? Water non-treatment system right here. Yeah, these, uh, all, all the roadway drains, they're, they're pretty much undersized up there and plugged right away from just regular debris on the bridge. But right now, all, all the water that lands on the bridge goes untreated straight into the lake. Um, yeah, but if the bridge was here, we'd do that anyhow. Pardon me? If the bridge wasn't here, the water was coming back. Yeah, but, but it wouldn't take all the sediment, all the dirt that, that's, that collects on the roadway just from regular traffic. It's, it's, it's taking that and, and pumping it right into the lake. We have no way of filtering it or catching it. Um, the, new, the new bridge would filter that. I believe it'll run it off the bridge, but I have to ask Patrick Clark. There's, um, yes, it'll run some of it off the bridge where it'll be treated. But there's also some, we're working some care treatment systems, so there'll be like a um, filtering wetlands that's built around the piers so that the water will work way through. So right now, the salmon and everything are getting a snout full of copper or whatever happens to be on the bridge, but the new bridge, the water will be treated, so it'll be better for fish. You keep saying copper. Where's the copper coming from? I think it comes from, um, I think it, it's just something that it comes from exhaust and just yeah, it's, it, part, I, it's part of the it, emissions. Part of the emissions. I, I also know that these are old galvanized pipes, and some of the testing we've done shows zinc going into the water. I think what they, um, when they've done the testing, I believe they found a lot of zinc going in, and the old galvanizing off of these um, is slowly um, going into the lake. I, how it does it, you know, and how it's wearing, I, I don't, I don't understand that. And I don't, I don't believe they put galvanized pipes like this directly into water anymore. I, if you want to know more, we've got caravans going down all of the heat. So the bridge is... What, what happened there was it was in the middle of construction. They were hydro demolishing the sidewalks and the deck. So there was no sidewalk or deck on the old I-90. Those had sidewalks across it that were unprotected. So those were all off, rebar was exposed, and you could see right into the deck, or into the um, pontoon. Um, at the same time, the new hatches, so we wouldn't be up on the roadway, they were putting hatches in the side of the bridge, yeah. watertight hatches. So they had cut holes already in the bridge, the contractor had cut holes in it. And then we got the storm, the rain, um, you know, started coming. The, they, had, they had it tarp, but it was still going in and the bridge kept getting lower in the water. The other side of that is they were also storing all their tiger demolishing water in there. The, this is the lower deck. We're, we're standing on the top of a pontoon. So if we were out there where we were before, the roadway is on here. Right now, this is just coming off the high rise. Right. So we're looking at what, how many feet here, Rob? Um, probably 30 feet there. And the new bridge, are, they're projecting how high we'll be off the pontoon? Um, I don't. I know that the clearances, I believe, are going to be 70 feet, but I don't know this deck here. It's going to be able to let a 70-foot vessel go under the under a high rise, I believe. Right. But I don't know how high the roadway. Will be. I I don't know how high the roadway will be. Sure, it probably is all in there, but you know, 
full type uh, expansion joint um, where the column goes up and it's a split column. So halfway up it splits, it's just an old fashioned uh, expansion joint that they don't use anymore. And, um, but there was signs of cracking um, there where it goes into one, so those are um, just some ties that, to hold it together. You can't get a good shot of it. Man. I can't see where you can get a good shot of the broken column. But this is where um, tugboat came through, was, was really aiming for the Montlake cut. That was his intended destination. Um, missed its turn, um, came through here, hit the columns, and um, took out one of the far east columns there, they, um, or uh, south column, um, and fractured it uh, with a you know, tugboat just shattered it. Uh, it was hollow, and we had to close uh, that eastbound lane, um, I can't remember for how many weeks, um, while a, a repair was made on it. Um, but all these columns here are, are vulnerable with, you know, being hollow and easy, easyable to fracture in an earthquake. This is where their modeling was done, that, that film that you see, so. I can't get a good sh shot of that. Oh, really? Hi. Yeah. I see one of the cables here. This is what the anchor cables look like. They go out. These are the shorter cables on the end.
So what, what is this? This is an, an anchor cable. Um, there at the center of each pontoon goes down. The cable goes all the way out to the either a fluke anchor or um, you know just a, a regular anchor out in the silt that uh, um, Patrick was talking about. And this is a cableway, so it goes up. And this is where we would do our adjusting uh, that you saw when you went inside the other pontoons. So as the lake goes up and down, these are the cables that we adjust and that hold the the bridge in place. These shorter cables on either end of the bridge are, I seem to be a little more susceptible to uh, stress than the longer cables, and uh, where we've had some of our problems have been on the shorter cables on the ends. That's interesting. Yeah, the stuff you see is just normal growth because the sunlight can hit it as you get deeper into the darker water, there's nothing growing on them. our pumping equipment for the lower deck, those large trailers that pump out equipment. So if there is a problem, it's already here. We can roll it to whatever pontoon we need, hook up and uh, get, it, get the cell pumped out. Thanks for all that.